more than a thousand people have now been killed in Israel and Gaza after a massive attack by Hamas militants that began at dawn on Saturday. Hamas recently gave southern Israel quite a shock with a massive attack. It's like they upgraded their military skills since taking over Gaza in 2007. As Ali Baraka, a big shot in Hamas, puts it, Necessity is the mother of invention. They've been getting some serious help and training from Iran and pals like Hezbollah. At the same time, they've been beefing up their own military might right in Gaza. Speaking of military might, in this video, let's look at what happened to Hamas's deadliest soldiers. Mohammed Daif. I can't think of another name to kick off this list other than this man. Mohammed Daif was born in 1965 in the Khan Yunis refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. Growing up in the midst of conflict and hardship, Daif's early life was marked by the struggle for survival. As a teenager, Daif witnessed the hard times faced by his people on a daily basis. It was during these formative years that he developed a deep-rooted sense of anger and determination to bring about change. In 1990, at the age of 25, Daif joined Hamas a militant organization that was gaining momentum in its resistance against Israeli occupation. From the moment he stepped foot into Hamas, Daif's commitment to the cause was unwavering. He quickly rose through the ranks, showcasing his strategic thinking and leadership skills. His nomadic lifestyle, constantly on the move to evade capture, earned him a reputation as a shadowy figure. Daif's involvement with Hamas brought him face to face with the harsh realities of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But it was in 1995 that Daif's name truly became synonymous with resistance. The Israeli military declared him their most wanted man, launching a relentless pursuit to capture or eliminate him. Despite the constant threat to his life, Daif remained undeterred. He continued to lead Hamas's military wing, the Iz ad-Din al-Qassam brigades. His strategic brilliance and ability to inspire his troops made him a formidable force on the battlefield. Throughout the years, Daif's involvement with Hamas and his role within the organization continued to evolve. He became a key figure in planning and executing military operations against Israel. His strong anti-Israeli sentiment and his commitment to the liberation of Palestine made him a revered figure among his comrades. Since being declared the Israeli military's most wanted man in 1995, Daif has survived an astonishing seven attempts on his life. The first assassination attempt came in 1996 when Israeli forces launched a missile strike on a building where Daif was believed to be hiding. He escaped unscathed, but the attempts on Daif's life did not stop there. In 2001, a car bomb targeted his vehicle, reducing it to a twisted heap of metal. Once again, Dyfe survived this attack. As the years went by, the attempts on Dyfe's life became more audacious and desperate. In 2002, Israeli forces dropped a one-ton bomb on a building where he was suspected to be hiding. The explosion was so powerful that it leveled the entire structure. Yet once again, Dyfe managed to escape. The Israeli military, frustrated by their repeated failures, resorted to increasingly sophisticated methods to eliminate Dyfe. In 2003, they launched a missile strike on a house where he was believed to be staying. The attack left the building in ruins, but Daif once again managed to slip away. In 2006, Israeli forces targeted a building where he was attending a meeting. The strike was precise and devastating, reducing the structure to rubble. Yet, against all odds, Daif survived. His ability to evade capture and emerge unscathed time and time again has earned him a legendary status among his comrades and a reputation as a man who cannot be defeated. But behind the tales of miraculous escapes lies a man who has paid a heavy price for his defiance. In 2014, tragedy struck when an Israeli airstrike targeted Daif's home, resulting in the loss of his wife and two children. Mohammed Daif's involvement in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been marked by his unwavering commitment. As the military commander of Hamas's Izzadin al-Qassam brigades, he has played a key role in planning and executing numerous military operations against Israel. One of the most notable military operations led by Daif was the Second Intifada, also known as the Al-Aqsa Intifada, which erupted in 2000. This uprising against Israeli occupation saw a wave of protests, demonstrations, and acts of resistance across the Palestinian territories. Other attacks like suicide bombings and rocket attacks sent shockwaves through Israel and garnered international attention. Dayaf's ability to inspire his troops and his tactical acumen made him a formidable force on the battlefield. One of the most audacious operations led by Deif was the 2006 capture of Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit. This high-profile abduction sparked a major crisis. Shalit was held captive by Hamas for five years, before being released in a prisoner exchange deal. The success of this operation further solidified Daif's reputation as a mastermind of resistance. Daif's actions have also drawn criticism and condemnation from Israel and its allies. He has been labeled a terrorist, and his organization, Hamas, has been designated as a terrorist group by several countries. Yahya Ayash 
In the dusty streets of Nablus, a city nestled in the heart of the West Bank, young Yahya Ayash was born in the late 1960s. Growing up in a region plagued by conflict and political unrest, Ayash's childhood was far from ordinary. From an early age, he witnessed the harsh realities of life under occupation, an experience that would shape his destiny in unimaginable ways. Yahya Ayash was raised in a modest Palestinian family, struggling to make ends meet amidst the chaos of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. His father, a laborer, worked tirelessly to provide for his wife and six children. Despite the hardships they faced, Ayash's parents instilled in him a strong sense of resilience and determination. As a young boy, Ayash displayed an exceptional aptitude for science and technology. His curious mind was always tinkering with gadgets and exploring the inner workings of machines. It was clear to those around him that he possessed a unique talent, one that would eventually lead him down a dark and dangerous path. In the late 1980s, as the first intifada swept across the Palestinian territories, Ayash found himself at the forefront of the resistance movement. He became deeply involved in the struggle for Palestinian independence. Ayash's technical skills soon caught the attention of the Palestinian militant group, Hamas, who recognized his potential as a valuable asset. Under their guidance, he honed his expertise in bomb-making, transforming himself into a lethal weapon in the fight against Israeli occupation. The young Ayash proved to be a quick learner, mastering the intricate art of constructing explosive devices with alarming precision. His meticulous attention to detail and innovative techniques set him apart from his peers, earning him the nickname The Engineer within the ranks of Hamas. But Ayash's journey towards becoming a notorious bomb-maker was not without its sacrifices. He had to sever ties with his family, going underground to protect them from the consequences of his chosen path. As the 1990s dawned, Ayash's reign of terror began to unfold. His bombs became increasingly sophisticated, targeting Israeli military installations, buses, and public spaces. The sheer devastation caused by his creations leave a trail of death and destruction. The media soon caught wind of Ayash's deadly exploits, and his name became synonymous with terror. Israeli authorities launched a relentless manhunt, desperate to bring him to justice. But Ayash proved to be elusive, always managing to slip through their fingers. To the outside world, Yahya Ayash was a faceless figure shrouded in mystery. His actions were seen as acts of ruthless violence, devoid of any moral compass. But to those who knew him intimately, Ayash was a complex character, driven by a deep-rooted belief in the righteousness of his cause. As Yahya Ayash's expertise in bomb-making grew, so did his influence within the ranks of Hamas. He became a key figure in the organization's military wing, orchestrating some of the most devastating attacks in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One of Ayash's most audacious attacks took place on April 6, 1994, when he masterminded the bombing of a bus in the heart of Tel Aviv. Packed with explosives, the bus turned into a deadly inferno, claiming the lives of eight innocent civilians and injuring dozens more. The attack sent a chilling message to the Israeli government and the international community. No one was safe from Ayash's wrath, but Ayash's ambitions didn't stop there. He continued to push the boundaries of terror, devising new and innovative methods to maximize the impact of his attacks. In July 1995, he orchestrated a series of bombings on Jerusalem buses, targeting crowded areas during rush hour. The coordinated attacks left six people dead and over a hundred injured. Ayash's ability to evade capture only added to his mystique. Despite the relentless efforts of Israeli intelligence agencies, he remained one step ahead, always managing to slip away at the last moment. But Ayash's actions were not without controversy. While he was hailed as a hero by some, others questioned the morality of his methods. The indiscriminate nature of his bombings, which often targeted civilians, drew criticism from both within and outside the Palestinian community. In January 1996, Ayash's reign of terror came to a sudden and tragic end. In a secretive operation, the Israeli agency Shin Bet found a link between Ayash and Osama Hamad, a childhood friend who sometimes stayed at his house in Gaza City. What makes it even more interesting is that Shin Bet had previous dealings with Kamil Hamad, who happens to be Osama's uncle. In October 1995, Shin Bet's agents approached Kamil Hamad and engaged in a high-stakes negotiation. Hamad asked for money and Israeli identity cards for himself and his wives. There was tension as Shin Bet threatened to expose its collaboration with Hamas. Eventually, under pressure, Hamad agreed to cooperate. The Shin Bet agents handed Hamad a cell phone. They informed him that the device was bugged, allowing them to eavesdrop on Ayash's conversations. What they omitted to mention was that concealed within the phone was a formidable payload, 15 grams of RDX explosive, a powerful high explosive often used in military 
military operations. Kamil Hamad gave the rigged phone to his nephew, Osama, knowing that Ayash often used Osama's phones. The big moment happened at 8 o'clock in the morning on January 5th, 1996, when Ayash's dad called him and Ayash answered. They didn't realize that an Israeli plane was secretly listening in and sending the conversation to an Israeli command post. When they were sure Ayash was on the call, Shin Bet did something drastic. They remotely made the phone explode and it killed Ayash instantly. This happened in Beit Lahia. Israel usually keeps quiet about its involvement in targeted killings. This lack of information led to a lot of rumors and guesses about how much they were involved in Ayash's death. Then, in 2012, a former Shin Bet director named Kami Gillon revealed the truth in a documentary called The Gatekeepers. At the same time, Kamil Hamad, who had helped betray Ayash, mysteriously disappeared. There were rumors in the Israeli media that, in exchange for his help, Hamad got a big reward. One million dollars, a fake passport, and a US visa. Ayash supporters mourned the loss of a fearless leader, while his enemies breathed a collective sigh of relief. But the impact of Ayash's actions would continue to reverberate for years to come. After Ayash's death, there were four suicide bombings in Israel in February and March 1996, causing the tragic loss of 78 lives. These bombings happened shortly after a 40-day mourning period for Ayash. The group behind these attacks called themselves the Disciples of the Martyr Yahya Ayash and said they were seeking revenge for his assassination. When Israeli security questioned one of the people involved in planning the attacks. They found out that the attacks were carried out by a group connected to the Qassam Brigades. Surprisingly, their main motivation seemed to be personal and revenge-driven rather than having big political goals. Adnan al Ghul. Another man who emerged as a key figure amid all the unrest was Adnan al Ghul. Born around 1962, al Ghul's journey into the dark realm of extremism began at a young age. Growing up in the Gaza Strip, al Ghul, just like many others, witnessed firsthand the struggles and hardships faced by his people. The region was plagued by poverty, violence, and a sense of hopelessness. It was in this environment that al Ghul's path took a fateful turn. As a teenager, al Ghul became increasingly disillusioned with the state of affairs in Gaza. He saw his people suffer under the weight of occupation and felt a burning desire to fight back against what he perceived as injustice. It was during this time that he first encountered the ideology of Hamas. The group's message of resistance and empowerment resonated deeply with Al Ghul, who saw it as a means to bring about change and reclaim the land he believed belonged to his people. In 1988, at the age of 26, Al Ghul made the fateful decision to join Hamas. He saw it as his duty to fight for the liberation of Palestine and to protect his people from what he saw as his Israeli aggression. Little did he know that this decision would set him on a path of violence and destruction. Al Ghul quickly rose through the ranks of Hamas thanks to his exceptional skills in handling explosives. His expertise in bomb making and his ability to develop weapons from smuggled raw materials made him an invaluable asset to the organization. But Al Ghul's rise to power came at a great personal cost. He lived a life of constant danger and uncertainty, always on the run from Israeli authorities who were determined to bring him to justice. He became a master of disguise changing his appearance and identity frequently to evade capture. Despite the risks, Al Ghul remained committed to the cause. He believed that violence was the only way to achieve justice for his people, and he was willing to sacrifice everything for that cause. In 1995, Al Ghul orchestrated one of the deadliest attacks in Israeli history, the Beit Lid Junction bombing. This horrific act of terrorism claimed the lives of 22 innocent Israelis and left many others injured. The attack put Al Ghul on the radar of intelligence agencies worldwide, but Al Ghul's reign of terror was far from over. In 1996, he masterminded another devastating attack, this time targeting the bustling Dizengoff Center in the heart of Tel Aviv. The bombing claimed the lives of 10 innocent civilians and left dozens more wounded. Israeli forces launched numerous operations to track him down, but Al Ghul always managed to slip through their fingers. But the life of a fugitive took its toll on Al Ghul. He lived in constant fear, never knowing when his luck would run out. The loss of his eldest son, Bilal, in a 2001 airstrike in Gaza only fueled his hatred and desire for revenge against Israel. Tragically, his second son, Mohammed, met a similar fate during a botched raid on the family home in Magazi, south of Gaza City. Despite the personal losses he endured, Al Ghul remained steadfast in his commitment to the cause. He continued to develop new weapons and strategies for Hamas, using his expertise to wreak havoc on Israeli targets. His actions were driven by a deep-seated belief that violence was the only means to achieve justice and liberation for his people. On September 26, 2003, Al Ghul reportedly attended 
attended a meeting with other high-ranking Hamas members, including Mohammed Daif, Ismail Haniyeh, and Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. Israeli forces, determined to eliminate the leadership of Hamas, bombed the house where they gathered. Miraculously, Al Ghul managed to escape unharmed, once again slipping through the grasp of his pursuers. But the close call only intensified the manhunt for Al Ghul. Israeli intelligence agencies were relentless in their pursuit, employing all means at their disposal to track him down. They knew that capturing or eliminating him would be a significant blow to Hamas and a victory for their own security forces. Finally, on October 21, 2004, the day that would mark the end of Adnan al Ghul's reign, Israeli Air Force AH-64 helicopters targeted his car in Gaza. The attack, a targeted killing, was swift and deadly. Al Ghul and his associate Imad Abbas were killed instantly. The death of Adnan al Ghul marked the end of an era for Hamas. His expertise in explosives and his role in orchestrating deadly attacks against Israeli targets cemented his place in history. But his story is not just one of violence and terror. It is also a story of personal tragedy, sacrifice, and the complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The legacy of Adnan al Ghul is a tough one. On one hand, he is remembered as a ruthless terrorist responsible for the deaths of numerous innocent civilians. His actions were driven by a deep-seated hatred and a belief in the righteousness of his cause. On the other hand, al Ghul is also seen by some as a martyr, a hero who fought for the liberation of his people. His ability to evade capture for so long and his expertise in explosives made him a symbol of resistance and defiance. To those who share his ideology, he is remembered as a martyr who gave his life for the cause. Ahmed Jabari Jabari's life story began in 1960 in Gaza City. He came from an activist family who had moved from Hebron due to an ongoing feud. He went to Gaza's Islamic University, where he studied history and graduated. But his life took a different direction. In 1982, things changed when Israeli authorities arrested Jabari. Back then, he was involved with a Palestinian militant group called Fatah. During his 13 years in prison, Jabari underwent a major transformation. He met important members of Hamas while in prison, like Abd al-Aziz Rantisi, Nizar Rayyan, and Salah Shehadeh. Their influence led him to switch from Fatah to join Hamas. Jabari became a prominent figure in the military wing of Hamas after his release from prison in 1995. He had a leadership role, overseeing both the organization's charity efforts and the coordination of finances for military activities. In addition to his administrative duties, he was actively involved in planning suicide bombings, targeting Israeli civilians during the mid-1990s. However, his militant activities drew the attention of the preventive security force of the Palestinian Authority. In October 1998, he was arrested on suspicion of involvement in the Kfar Darum bus attack. He remained in prison until late 1999, when he was eventually released. After his release, Jabari became an aide to Salah Shehadeh and Mohammed Aldehef, who were influential leaders in Hamas's military wing. His job was to help make their military operations more effective. Later, during the First Intifada, Jabari played a significant role role in the top leadership of Hamas's military, contributing to the first intifada cell. In 2002, after an Israeli airstrike wounded Mohammed Daif, the leader of Hamas's main armed wing, the Izaldin al Qassam brigades, Jabari took on the role of commander and operational head of the military wing during the second intifada, but Mohammed Daif still officially held his A leadership position. Under Jabari's leadership, Hamas's armed wing, the al Qassam brigades, became even more organized. During the intifada, Jabari was responsible for coordinating numerous attacks against Israel, including suicide bombings, which resulted in the deaths of many Israeli civilians and soldiers. On a fateful day in August 2004, tragedy struck the life of Jabari. An Israeli airstrike targeted Jabari's home in Gaza, aiming to assassinate him. The strike resulted in the loss of his eldest son, Mohammed, as well as the lives of his brother and three cousins. Jabari himself narrowly escaped unharmed. In a 2005 interview with Reuters, Jabari expressed his strong belief that jihad and resistance were the only effective ways to free his homeland. He didn't think negotiation and diplomacy would work. Jabari played a significant role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He was in charge of overseeing the captivity of Gilad Shalit, an Israeli soldier who was kidnapped by Palestinian militants in 2006. According to the Israeli government, Jabari was also instrumental in Hamas's takeover of the Gaza Strip from the Fatah-led Palestinian Authority in 2007, which solidified his influence in the region. In December 2008, during Israel's Operation Cast Lead offensive against the Gaza Strip, Jabari's residence 
was reportedly destroyed in an airstrike, but the exact details of how this happened remained unclear. In September 2010, he made a clear threat to increase attacks on Israel, with the goal of disrupting peace talks between Israel and Palestine. He was determined to end Israel's control of Gaza using religious beliefs, weapons, missiles, tunnels, and commando operations. A significant moment in Jabari's story occurred in October 2011 when a prisoner exchange was arranged. Gilad Shalit was returned to Israel in exchange for 1,027 Palestinian prisoners. Jabari himself accompanied Shalit to the Rafah crossing with Egypt, overseeing the mission very closely. His impact in the political arena also became evident when he was elected to the political bureau of Hamas in April 2012. Beyond his public persona, Jabari was instrumental in enforcing ceasefires from the Palestinian side. He worked to restrain rival militant groups from firing rockets and missiles into Israel, contributing to moments of respite amid the ongoing conflict. Moreover, he founded an association called Nur, aimed at assisting martyrs and prisoners. According to Gershon, Baskin, who was involved in negotiations for Gilad Shalit's release, Jabari received a draft of a long-term ceasefire agreement with Israel just before his assassination. However, this claim is disputed, with some questioning its credibility. Jabari was a very secretive and cautious person. He rarely appeared in public, didn't use smartphones, and relied on trusted messengers to communicate with other Hamas leaders. This extreme caution was because he survived five assassination attempts. On November 14, 2012, things took a tragic turn for him. An Israeli drone killed him as he was driving on Omar Mukhtar Street in Gaza City. His loyal bodyguard, Mohammed Al-Hams, also met the same fate in that attack. The reason for this assassination was three days of continuous rocket attacks on southern Israel by Gaza militants. Israel saw these rocket attacks as the reason to eliminate Jabari. This event marked the start of Operation Pillar of Defense, an Israeli military campaign. In a joint effort between Shin Bet and the Israeli Air Force, they carried out an operation that led to rocket attacks from Palestinian groups in Gaza. This sparked a back-and-forth conflict between Israel and Gaza, with Israel launching counter-strikes for four days. Thousands of people attended Jabari's funeral, which started at the Shifa Hospital, passed by his home, and ended at the Great Mosque of Gaza for final prayers. He was laid to rest at the Sheikh Radwan Cemetery in the northern part of the city, Salah Shehada. Salah Shehada was a name that struck fear into the hearts of many. He was born in Gaza on February 24, 1953. Little did the world know that this seemingly ordinary man would go on to become one of the most influential leaders of the Palestinian Islamist movement, Hamas. In 1987, she had joined Hamas, a decision that would shape the course of his life and the lives of countless others. His dedication and unwavering commitment to the cause quickly caught the attention of his superiors. This propelled him through the ranks of the organization. As the Al-Aqsa Intifada erupted, in the late 1990s, tensions between Israelis and Palestinians reached a boiling point. It was during this time that Shahed's true colors began to emerge. Israel accused him of masterminding a series of deadly attacks against both Israeli soldiers and civilians. Shahed's involvement in these attacks was not limited to planning and orchestrating. He was also deeply involved in the production of Qassam rockets, homemade weapons that became synonymous with Hamas. These rockets were named after the Iz ad Din al Qassam brigades, the military wing of Hamas, but Shahadi's ambitions did not stop there. He played a pivotal role in smuggling military equipment into Gaza, where Hamas operated. Under his leadership, Hamas field commanders in Gaza and the West Bank carried out many attacks, targeting Israeli forces and civilians alike. The world watched in horror as suicide bombings and other acts of violence became all too common. Shihad's influence and power within Hamas were undeniable, and his actions had far-reaching consequences. In early 2000, his reign of terror was momentarily halted when he was captured by Israeli forces. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison but his imprisonment did little to quell the violence. Then, in a surprising turn of events, Shihad was released in May 2000 as part of a larger prisoner exchange between Israel and Hamas. His freedom reignited fears and raised questions about the effectiveness of the justice system in dealing with individuals like Shihad. With his release, Shihad wasted no time in resuming his activities within Hamas. He resumed his role in the production of Qassam rockets and continued to oversee the operations of field commanders in Gaza and the West Bank. Under his guidance, Hamas developed an extensive network for distributing these rockets. The production facilities were hidden in residential areas, making it difficult for Israeli forces to locate and destroy them. Shihad's strategic planning and meticulous execution allowed Hamas to continuously replenish its arsenal, posing a constant threat to Israeli security. The Qassam rockets became a weapon of choice for Hamas, used to target Israeli towns and cities near the Gaza Strip. These attacks were not only aimed at military installations, but also at civilian populations. Shihad's policy of terror attacks defined by Hamas 
resulted in the loss of innocent lives and widespread fear among Israelis. The impact of these attacks cannot be overstated. Israeli citizens lived in constant fear of rocket attacks, never knowing when or where the next strike would occur. The psychological toll on the population was immense, with families forced to seek shelter and live in a state of constant vigilance. But it wasn't just the Qassam rockets that Shahid was involved in. He also played a crucial role in smuggling military equipment into Gaza, further bolstering Hamas's capabilities. Shahid's network of contacts and his deep understanding of the region allowed him to successfully navigate underground arms trafficking. The smuggling operations were carried out through a network of tunnels that connected Gaza to neighboring countries. These tunnels served as a lifeline for Hamas, providing a steady supply of weapons, ammunition, and other military equipment. The influx of weapons and military equipment into Gaza allowed Hamas to expand its influence and carry out more sophisticated attacks. However, it is important to note that Shahad's actions were not without consequences. The Israeli defense forces, in their efforts to dismantle Hamas's infrastructure, targeted smuggling tunnels and weapons caches. These operations aimed to disrupt the flow of weapons and weaken Hamas's capabilities. But it was on a fateful day, July 22, 2002, that the world would witness the devastating consequences of his actions. The Israeli defense forces, determined to put an end to his reign of terror, targeted the house in which Shahad was living. Using a one-ton bomb dropped by an F-16 plane, the Israeli defense forces unleashed a devastating attack. The explosion not only claimed the life of Salah Shahada, but also that of his wife, his daughter, and seven members of a neighboring family. The attack on Shahid's house received widespread condemnation from other Middle Eastern nations, Western Europe, and the United States. Human rights organizations around the world decried it as a war crime, a blatant disregard for innocent lives. In response to the international outcry, the Israel Defense Forces and Shin Bet, the Israeli Internal Security Agency, established a joint inquiry into the attack. The inquiry aimed to assess the operation and determine whether any mistakes were made. While the inquiry concluded that the operation was correct and professional, it also acknowledged shortcomings in the available intelligence. The findings of the joint inquiry did little to satisfy those who believed the attack was unjustified. In 2005, a class action lawsuit was filed alleging that the targeted killing of Salah Shehada was illegal under international law. The lawsuit sought to hold those responsible for the attack accountable for their actions. Additionally, in 2009, a war crimes probe was initiated in Spain. The Spanish Court of Appeals, however, rejected an official inquiry into the targeted killing of Shahada in 2002, citing jurisdictional limitations. If you enjoyed this video, click on the card showing on your screen right now for more videos.